I want to talk about something really interesting to finish off this session. And what I'm very passionate about is human-like robots, robots that look like us. I want to start, though, by telling you a story. About a year ago, I was doing some robotics research, and I had a little robot on my desk called Hydraulica. And this is kind of what she looked like. She had a few mods after this. But, um, and what Hydraulica was built for was to be a really simple desktop robot that could play video games. So she also has a little joystick that goes with her that's not shown in this photo here. She has a webcam that can look at the screen, and she can move her head around, and she can play video games. So this little robot, which was super cute, uh, was, was designed to play this video game Pong that I'm sure many of you have played when you're a kid. And you basically set the robot going. It tries to play the game, and it's really bad at it. And then you leave it going for like a few hours or sometimes a few days. And usually when you come back, nothing very much interesting happens. But there was one experiment where I picked the parameters just right. And what I found is when I, when I came back, she'd mastered the game. This is like amazing. She was you know, doing really cool little tricks with the paddle. And I was like, oh, you know, I felt like I'd created something. The problem was then I had to stop the experiment. I basically had to take my little AI robot and wipe its mind. And this really affected me on a deep level. For the first time, I felt like I'd actually done something unethical or you know, just bad to a robot. And I'd never had that feeling before. And I think what's going to happen is at the moment, you're probably thinking, OK, this is a sci-fi nerd that thinks a little robot is real. Um, <laughs> But I don't think it's going to be these little robots giving us sci-fi nerd researchers weird feelings for a while, because we're actually being able to create some much more advanced and more human-like robots soon. So what I do at Sanctuary and what my passion is in life is to try and create robots that are indistinguishable from us physically, cognitively, and emotionally. We want to build human mimics. We call these things synths, which is short for synthetic humans. And if we succeed in the goal of building these things, I think it's going to be one of the most impactful things that we're going to see happen to our civilization, if not the most impactful thing. This will be way more impactful than the Industrial Revolution. Because then what we did was we took machines and we automated physical power, physical labor. That left us with our brains to now do a bunch of intellectual stuff. What we're doing this time is we're automating intellectual power and cognitive power. So there are a lot of interesting questions arise from that about what that means in terms of being human. And I'm going to come back to some of those questions a little bit later. It's not just me that's excited about humanoid robots. I'm starting to see them pop up all over the place. The robot on the left here is called Robothespian. And this is a robot. It's a static robot, so it stands still, but it's able to gesture. And it's used for stage performances, theatrical performances, and in science museums and other places as a kind of robot greeter. So you may well be seeing him up on stage instead of me next time <laughs> giving a talk. He's actually given a TED talk, if any, a TEDx talk, if any of you want to watch that. It's quite interesting. The robot in the middle is a robot built by Boston Dynamics. This is also a full-scale humanoid robot. This one is fully mobile. It can walk around outside. It can pick up and carry large payloads. It can open doors. It can carry backpacks for soldiers, a very capable robot. And the robot on the right is uh, Sophia, who you may have seen in the news recently, a robot developed by Hanson Robotics. And she has a lot of cool emotional facial expressions that she can make that look very human-like. And it's interesting to see how she interacts with other humans. So driving this humanoid robot revolution are several technologies that are coming together. I'm just going to go over two of them. But there are many, many more that are converging. So the first one is advances in hardware. So we now have manufacturing techniques that we didn't have access to a few years ago. Uh, this little uh, 3D printed piece I'm showing here is something that I had my engineers design. In about half a day, they came up with a design. 
And that was just an envelope and a bunch of constraints. And then the AI algorithm actually turned that into a beautiful piece like this that looks so biological and fluid, almost looks like it evolved rather than it, than it was designed. And then we took that generative design and we printed it on our carbon fiber 3D printer in our lab, again, in half a day. And the final piece came out. It was beautiful. It was stronger than aircraft-grade aluminum. It was a fraction of the cost and half the weight. We're now able to build these humanoid robots in a day. And what that means is we can iterate on them day after day after day. This is an exponential advance in how we're able to create hardware. AI is advancing at the same rate. The hardware behind AI, these banks of GPUs that were originally used in the video game industry and now are being used in training deep neural nets. So the brains are getting better. Faster GPUs means we can try out more neural net models, not just deeper and better models, but try many and many of them at the same time. More experiments makes us go faster and faster in AI. There's a problem with putting AI in charge of robots, though. AI's learning systems, they don't really know a lot at the start before being given the reins. So what tends to happen is when you put an AI in charge of a robot, the robot starts smashing things and destroying things and destroying itself. So you can't do that very easily. But there are ways around this. And there are, there are some new technologies that are helping with this, too. One new technology is immersive teleoperation for gathering quality training data for uh, robots. So in this situation, you have a human who is um, wearing some form of exosuit technology, a large, complicated rig, usually powered. And this allows them to take control of the robot, so they're able to move the robot around. Analogously, the robot follows. Uh, they're able to see what the robot is seeing and hear what it's hearing and speak. It's almost as though the consciousness of the human has been transplanted into this robot. And if you've ever done this, it's a really weird experience. You feel like you are the robot now, and you're out there in the world. And what happens when you turn around and you see your meat body sat over there in the VR rig? It's a very weird feeling. But this is becoming uh, more common now, and it's a great way for humans to help robots do some tasks in the world that they wouldn't be able to do initially. What we do with this is we use a process called human-in-the-loop training, where the human teleoperating the robot proceeds, and an AI listens in the background. So the AI has access to all that perception data that's coming from the robot's senses, and it also watches what the human's doing. It watches the action suggestions flowing in the other direction. What the AI tries to do is it tries to learn to copy the human. So the AI actually mimics the human and gets better and better and better at the task over time. The cool thing about this is not only is it becoming easier and easier to build these human-like robot systems, these exosuits are now kind of being commoditized through the field of VR. So a lot of people now have VR rigs at home that enable them to play some pretty cool video games. Those same rigs could be used to be put in control of these humanoid robots in the field, so people in their homes can control an increasingly large number of humanoid robots that are, um, that are out there. This is fascinating, because if you think about what this means for a moment, for society and for the economy, a person could be doing work and the physical body that's actually moving things and doing things is somewhere completely different, maybe in a different country. So that's something really interesting to think about. And also, as 5G cellular networks come online, these robots are going to start getting up out of their seats, unplugging their internet tether, and starting to walk around in the world, because we can now do this same process over the mobile networks. OK. So why are people building human-like robots? Isn't this a really weird thing? Can't we just you know, build sort of factory robots to do everything? Well, there's some really good reasons why human-like robots are on the rise. The first reason is what I call the practical answer. Our entire world, all our infrastructure, 
is designed for humans. So everything we interact with, think about it like doorknobs, airplane seats, all control systems, uh, these things, like everything is designed to have a human interact with it. So if you can have human-like robots come on the scene, we don't need to modify any of the infrastructure that's already there. The robots can just start coming in, providing value without any supporting infrastructure needed. Another reason why human-like robots are becoming more and more popular is this sort of philosophical answer. And this is a little bit controversial in the research world, but I truly believe that a robot that shares our physical experience of the world, that has the same senses, that has the same limbs, that can move around in the same way as we can, will have the same kind of concepts emerging in its AI mind. So if you think about that, we can't even understand what our, our like, you know, evolutionary relatives are thinking things like chimps, let alone dolphins and other animals. How do we ever expect to know what an AI is thinking if it doesn't share some of the same uh, perceptual inputs that we do? So if we have these humanoid robots and they're having a similar subjective experience of the world as we are because they have similar bodies, then we're going to be able to communicate with them more easily. We're going to be able to explain what it means to hold a warm cup of coffee on a cold day. Try explaining that to a self-driving car. The third answer is really personal to myself. I think that as humanoid robots start to be developed, we'll be entering a world where we can actually begin to merge with them. There'll be a merger between biological humans and between robotic humans. This is coming online as we start to understand more about how the brain works. We're able to plug in these brain-computer inter interface devices into our own brain that can control robots. We'll be able to bring new parts of robotic technology into our own bodies. And we're using inspiration from things like how our own skin works to design the next generation of robots. So I don't think that there's going to be this this split between the robots and the humans in the future. I think there'll be a sort of a sliding scale between fully robotic and fully human, and there'll be all these fascinating, interesting, diverse kind of beings in the middle. So the problem with all this is that it's going to turn our world upside down. We don't know how to answer a lot of the questions that are going to arise about ethics, about morality, about social economic policy. What are we going to do about all this? These are some big questions, and I can't go into them in like seven minutes. But what I do want to do is try and give you a different perspective about thinking about this. Because I'm for the robots. I already told you the story of Hydraulica and how I had to delete her tiny brain which had fleetingly grown into something beautiful and then was sadly wiped out of existence. Um, but the, seriously, this is something we're going to have to start considering. As we build more and more powerful AIs that start to exhibit some of the properties of sentience and consciousness, even if they start behaving like animals, is it OK to just, to just delete those experiments? At some point, it won't be. There are other ethical issues that arise when you're building uh, human-like robots. So I already mentioned that AIs learn by making a lot of mistakes in the world. People and animals learn in the same way. There's a whole field of AI called reinforcement learning, where you actually reward the robot for doing something good, and you punish the robot for doing something bad. The problem is, is if you're training a robot AI system like this, you want to make sure that those mechanisms are working correctly. So you have to test the very extreme limits of pain and the very extreme limits of pleasure, right? This is how we test software systems. So we're going to have to effectively torture robots, put them into this extreme pain situation just to check that the code is working properly. Is that ethical? I don't think so, but what option do we have? We're trying to make sure that these, these beings end up like us. There are other thorny issues, too. For example, the issue of identity. 
So humans are really lucky, right? We have, we have one brain inside one body, and we don't even think about that. It's just like it, it's taken for granted. Robots and AI are not like that. An AI brain can be copied, it can be cloned, and it can be put into another identical robot body. You can have one brain controlling two or three or 10 robot bodies. You can have two bodies that an AI might switch between. This sense of the mind and the body being one thing in our world that has one unit of citizenship is going to be completely broken when these new entities start coming online. So this is a really weird situation. We're going to have to think a lot about what this means when we have these, these entities that aren't quite the same. I mean, maybe we'll look at one, and then the next second, a different mind will have switched in, and it'll be a totally different robot person, and you wouldn't know. So there's a lot of issues in this area, in the ethics, and we have to be really thinking about these as we're going forward. So at SU, maybe we don't just think about the exponential technologies and the things that are driving this, but let's think about the exponential problems that are going to arise from some of these new technologies too. I want to add in a little bit of optimism here, because a lot of what I've been saying about issues and a lot of sci-fi movies and TV portray a very dystopian world. But there is a different way of thinking about this. I think there is a lot of optimism that can come out of thinking about a world that's full of synths living amongst us. We're going to be able to explore our minds more because we take inspiration from neuroscience to build the new waves of AI, the new types of AI brains. So that drives us to have to understand the human brain better. We're going to make such advances in neuroscience just by, by root of AI that we're actually going to be able to reverse engineer our own minds and understand us more. And what helps you understand what it means to be human more than trying to build another human? Some of the cool things I like to think about, virtual teleportation. So if you have one of these teleop rigs, a VR rig, and it's completely immersive, and then you, know, you have your robot over in Sri Lanka or somewhere, you could teleport there. And then you could teleport to another destination. So if, this, if, the, um, if the sensation here is good enough, it will feel like you're literally moving all over the world um, at the speed of light. That's going to change our society, too. But I think it's going to be awesome. Human-like robots, I believe, can help a lot with social isolation issues. If you have these robots that are very human-like, you can also create them to be very empathetic. You could create a robot who is the perfect friend, the perfect partner, even the perfect lover. right? And that robot could be with you. How is that going to affect human relationships? Using these robots in things like education and healthcare, I think, has obvious benefits. Um, a robot teacher could be trained in many disciplines, not just one discipline, and could switch between them, and also um, be highly tuned to whether or not a particular student is, uh, is learning well. Reimagining our species, this, this is this idea of us becoming more than human, merging with machines? What are we going to be in the future when we're not quite biological? Um, Peter Diamandis talks about a world of abundance quite a lot, and I think it's really interesting to think about the link between abundance and human-like robots. Because normally people think of, oh, the robots are going to take all the jobs, and then what will we do? But I like to think of it as the robots are going to take away all the work but that will drive the cost of goods to zero, and we'll have to come up with ways where humans don't work, but all those goods will be free. So we'll be able to live in, in this world of abundance that you've been hearing about through this mechanism. And I think that they will solve some of our biggest global challenges in the future. My personal favorite is imagining robots as super scientists. So imagine a scientist AI mind that could read every single research paper that was published every day, correlate all the contents of those research papers, and make advancements towards science. So these human-like robots with advanced AI minds might be doing things in not too long, like 
understanding what black holes are and dark energy and creating warp drives and creating time travel, creating amazing new technologies for our civilization too. So I used to show this, I've showed this slide quite a few times because I was really trying to get the idea of what it might look like to have a society where synths and humans live together. But I always thought it was a bit of a crappy slide because it's kind of abstract and, you know, it, it's not real. Um, so what I did recently was I was like, hey, there's something I can do to make that slide better. So I took a group photo of our team at Sanctuary and um, three of the people in this photo are not human. Wonder if you can spot them. <laughs> but I really wanted to try and make that abstract slide real. And this is the kind of society I see in the future. And I hope that we can all live together and solve global challenges together. Thank you. Thank you.